I'm sure, has been a long week, a full week, and a good week. Um, but we appreciate you being here this morning, and I appreciate you letting me come. What do I need to do? Push it on? Thank you. I appreciate you guys helping me out. All right. Let me try again. Is that better? Am I coming through? There we go. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate These guys helped me out a lot to get the PowerPoint ready and to get this going as well. So appreciate you letting me not go the whole way without... I mean, I'll try not to hit that again. Um, I appreciate you not only being here this morning, but I appreciate you letting me be here this morning. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about Southeast through the years. Um, never been here before, though. The people I've known that have come through the program, and I didn't even know Randy Cook until this morning had gone through the program. People I appreciate like him that have been through here. And then people I've known before who came to work with Southeast. Uh, people like David Leip and Jacob Evans and Will Hanstein. I've appreciated them. So I've always heard good things about Southeast, but never had the chance to come visit myself. So I've enjoyed being here. I enjoyed the lectures yesterday. Um, I've enjoyed Randy's thoughts this morning. I know Steve's going to have great thoughts after this, and I appreciate uh, being able to be here for this one. The story of Scripture is a great theme, and I love what you're doing here uh, this year. And I love our topic. I hope our topic will be encouraging. It's sure a good one. You can see it on the screen. I'll be looking at the screen there in the back. Um, and let me back up just a little bit to where I want it to be. Let's see here. A little bit more. There we go. There we go. The story of Scripture, uh, Christ, His crucifixion. So we get to talk about the cross this morning. And the verse that I just clicked past in Luke 23 is the theme verse for this hour. It says, when they came, and I've got the New American Standard up here. It says, when they came to the place called the skull... There they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. You notice as the New American Standard does, it calls it the skull. Uh, I understand that the Aramaic word is Golgotha. Some people say Golgotha. I've always said Golgotha. Uh, that was the Aramaic term. We translate it in English as the skull. And you can hear just from that, this was a place where people died by weird quirks of history and the way the twists and turns of history, we've come to know it really more as Calvary, which comes from the Latin translation of that. In fact, most of our songs, for whatever reason, often refer to it not only as Calvary, but often the, the hill of Calvary. You might notice in this passage, it calls it just the place. The Bible doesn't call it a hill, although I'm told that in... Uh, in church history, not too far after the New Testament, people started calling it the hill of Calvary or the hill of Golgotha. Um, and maybe it's appropriate that it's called a hill because the cross stands high above the entire story of Scripture, doesn't it? In fact, that's how I'd like us to picture it this morning, how I pictured it for myself as I was putting my thoughts together, is to picture the cross not only on a, on a hill as we stand by it today, but to picture it up on a on a grand overlook. That's something you know much better here in East Tennessee than we know over in West Tennessee. As Mark said, I'm over in Memphis. We're the flat part of the state, and we get that. We don't have a lot of overlooks over there. There's, some, there's a few. You can go, and there's some good spots to look over the Mississippi River. There's some, some buildings you can go up, the Peabody Hotel, and stand on the roof and look over everything. Uh, but over here with your mountains, you've got all sorts of overlooks. You've got grand places, that, and people seem to have their favorite ones, where you can go and just see over the whole scene. And if you're like me, standing in those places gives you a sense of awe. And it gives you a sense of appreciation for God's power and God's glory and God's ability to put all these things you see together. And this overlook of standing next to the cross over the whole story of Scripture really does the same thing for me. It gives me a sense of the awe of God's power and glory and bringing all these things together. Because as we stand up here at the overlook of Scripture, one thing we notice is that all roads of Scripture lead through the cross. You know, they used to say about Rome, back when the Roman Empire was putting all their roads out, and, and the road system did so much, not only for Christianity, but for their economy in the Roman Empire. They used to say that all roads lead to Rome. Well, as you look out over the story of Scripture, what you notice is that all roads lead to the cross. And as you look back one way, you, you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And as the roads diverge from there, it goes through deserts and, and through exiles and through temples and past altars and, and in all sorts of direction, across rivers. 
But yet it all, they all converge back, we notice, at this overlook of the cross. And if we look the other way, the, the road goes a little way to the tomb that Steve's going to talk about in just a few minutes. And then it diverges again. All over the Roman Empire, across seas and through cities and marketplaces, all roads lead to the cross and all roads lead from the cross going forward. The cross stands high above the story of Scripture. What I'd like us to do with our time this morning then is just to imagine that with me, if you would, that we're all standing here on this overlook next to the cross I just want us to look around, just look around at what we see and what we learn about the story of Scripture and about God and about ourselves and about people, and hopefully we'll leave with an even deeper appreciation of the cross we already love as we walked in here this morning. I want us to start by looking backwards, and uh, this is the one we'll spend the most time on, I believe. Uh, I want us to, to look backwards toward what has come before the cross. The things we've already been talking about this week here at Southeast and the way all those roads have gone different directions to come converge here at this overlook. And if you look all the way back to that garden, you see where Adam and Eve sinned and they were separated from God. And it's the first hint that we were going to need something. It's the first hint that we were separated from God. They're, they're out of the garden after that. In fact, God even makes it makes it permanent with an angel and a sword that they would not be able to come back to that special place where they'd had such a close relationship with God. And just a little further past the garden, we look back and we see Cain. And as Cain is angry, you remember, because God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. God says to him, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? He says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And then notice this. And if you do not do well... Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. We look all the way back there in Genesis 4, and we already see what our battle is. We see that the battle is with sin, that it is our greatest enemy. It's no accident that when the angel was talking to Joseph, he said, you're going to name your son Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus could have been anything. Could have been Caesar, could have led armies, could have done anything he wanted to do. What he was was a savior, because that's what we needed. Sin was our biggest enemy. We see all the way back there that we were going to need something like right here at the cross. We see in the Old Testament sacrifices, all those altars, all those animals, all those temples and tabernacles. Leviticus 17.11 explains a little bit of why those were needed. It says the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. That blood that was shed and all those sacrifices. It was pointing to the fact that sin is so evil. And we forget that sometimes. We want to pretend that sin is just a mistake or it's not a big deal. Sin is so evil and so wrong and so bad. It's hurt so many people. Only life can pay for it. It deserves a sentence of life. And the best that the Old Testament did was the sacrifices of bulls and goats, which of course we know it was going to need much more than that, as the Hebrew writer will make so clear uh, in a few books. But here in Leviticus 17, it says all that blood that was shed, it's because that blood represented life. We see the foreshadowing of the cross that we were going to need. We see that foreshadowing in the, before us and all the prophets that said so much about this place, especially Isaiah. Many of you, this might be your favorite passage to read as we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. But here in Isaiah, starting verse 4, there's other verses here that point to the cross. But I'm just going to read 4 through 6. It says, Surely our griefs he himself bore. Talking about the servant that was going to come. And our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We look back and we see that promise that what was going to happen right here at the cross was going to be needed. Our sins 
that were being paid for by the blood of bulls and goats as best they could were going to really be paid for by him, the servant to come. And it's hard not to see echoes everywhere in the Old Testament. It's hard not to see a foreshadowing of the cross when God comes to Abraham and says, take your son who you love, your only son, and offer him on the mountain. Abraham, with such faith that, as far as we know, didn't even ask questions, trusted God, knew what he was doing. It's hard not to see the cross when you look back at the Passover, when the children of Israel were told to put blood on the doorpost, and when, as Exodus 12, 13 says, when I see the blood, I will pass by, and there will not be punishment. The blood of Christ does the same thing for us. When God sees the blood, he passes over us. It's hard not to see the cross as Jesus would see it in the bronze serpent of Numbers chapter 21. Where Jesus would point back from John 3 and say, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And so as those serpents were biting the children of Israel and, and, and God told Moses, there's a way out, make this bronze serpent. And when people are bitten, they look to the serpent and they will be healed and saved and they will live. Jesus says in the same way, I will be lifted up. And when people are bitten, I think is the analogy, by sin that would kill us, we look to the cross and the cross saves us. The more we look backwards from the cross, the more we see foreshadows everywhere. But let's look just a little closer as we still look backwards, but a little closer to the path. And I want us just to walk through for a few minutes uh, the events that led Jesus here. It's always been an enjoyable study to me, just to walk through, because it challenges me. I think it deepens my faith every time. Uh, to walk through and be reminded of what Jesus went through to come to this place on the cross. It starts back at a Passover meal uh, the Last Supper, we often call it, where Jesus is there gathered with his apostles and he, he washes their feet, including the feet of Judas, which amazes me. And then Jesus takes that bread and says, eat this, this is my body, which is given for you, Luke's account tells us. And then he takes the cup and says, take this cup, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. They would know very soon just exactly what Jesus meant. They didn't seem to at the time. But right there, eventually at some point, Judas goes out. And, and John 13 tells us twice that in some way, Satan entered into the heart of Judas to do that. And I don't think that means that Judas wasn't making his own choices. But in some way, Satan was encouraging Judas and tempting Judas to help betray Jesus. Now, that tells me a couple things. It might tell me that Satan didn't understand what the plan of salvation was. You know, Satan's not God. He's not omnipotent. He doesn't know everything. Satan seems to have thought that putting Jesus on the cross would somehow be a victory for Satan. It would not be. As God has so often done, he takes something that looks like defeat and turns it into victory. He does that with the cross. In some ways, Satan was trying to help put Jesus on the cross. I think if he'd known the plan, he probably wouldn't have. It also reminds me of what Judas was doing. They had to get Jesus away from the crowds. The crowds loved Jesus. The religious leaders were so angry about him. They had wanted to kill him from way back in Mark chapter 2. They were ready to get rid of Jesus very early in his ministry. They were jealous of him. And after he raised Lazarus from the dead that Randy talked about just a minute ago, that had finally, that was the final straw. They said, that's it. If we don't do something, everybody's going to follow him. We've got to get rid of him. We've got to kill him. And so they put the word out. If you see Jesus at this Passover, you tell us, and we're going to take him in. But Jesus did not sneak into Jerusalem. Jesus came in on a donkey with what felt like a parade as people were putting down palm leaves and celebrating. And the Jewish leaders knew, we cannot just grab this guy in front of everybody. There's going to be a riot. And so they had to do it in a way where people weren't around. Judas would be the way to do that. Because Judas knew a place that they would go. And so after that Lord's Supper, they, they then go to the Garden of Gethsemane as Judas goes out to get his group together. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and that amazes us every time, doesn't it? Because here is Jesus who came for this very purpose, uh, to, to die for our sins. And, and yet now that he's right on the doorstep, as he knows all the pain and suffering he's about to go through, he's crying, and he's praying, God, if there's some way we can... Not do this. Let's please do it differently. But I trust your will. Your will be done, not mine. 
He's sweating, and Luke describes it as sweating like drops of blood. And I've heard people say that maybe that's a medical thing, that it was actually blood coming out. And I don't know if that's what it's saying. But, but at least it's dripping like blood would drip from a wound. I've been upset about things before. And I've prayed, I feel like, some, some deep prayers about things before. I've never been praying in such agony that sweat, I just started sweating, and it started pouring off of my head. Tells you something about the agony that Jesus knew all that he was about to go through. And then that crowd comes with Judas and they've got torches and they've got weapons and they all come together. And, and, and remember, Peter grabs the sword and swings and takes off part of Malchus's ear. And Jesus speaks up and says, hey, that's not what we're doing here. Don't you know if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels and they'd come finish this all right now. A legion, I understand, was somewhere between 4,000 and 6,000 soldiers. We sing the song, Jesus could have called 10,000 angels, and even that sells short what Jesus said. Jesus was saying, I could call between 48,000 and 72,000 angels right now, and they'd come rescue me, but we're doing this so the will of God will be fulfilled. They would take Jesus off, and as you pull the gospel accounts together, there were six trials altogether. Three Jewish trials and three Roman trials that Jesus would go through on the path to the cross. The first Jewish trial, they took him before Annas, who was, he's called the high priest in John. Um, although Caiaphas is also called the high priest, John makes clear that Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. It seems like many Jews still felt like he was the real high priest. So he took Jesus before Annas, and Jesus doesn't really answer, but when he does answer, he says, look, I, I spoke openly. You can ask anybody what I said. And somebody hit him. Can you imagine being in the presence of Jesus and seeing somebody hit him? It was the first of many blows Jesus would take during this night. I don't know if this one drew blood or not. But they struck him and said, how dare you talk to the high priest like that? If only they knew whose presence they were in. They eventually sent him then to the second trial to Caiaphas. It's still the middle of the night. They don't want people to openly know what they're doing. There might be a riot in Jerusalem. So here they are gathered as the leaders in the middle of the night in a cowardly way to try to get rid of Jesus. And they can't get their witnesses straight. And Caiaphas is getting frustrated. And finally, he just asked Jesus, are you the son of the blessed? Are you the son of God or not? And Jesus said, that's right, I am. And you're going to see me seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the angels of God. And I imagine, in my mind's eye, I imagine that all of heaven shouted amen or celebrated in some way, but Caiaphas did not. Caiaphas tore his clothes and said, you've heard blasphemy? What do you say? They said he deserves death. It wasn't time to make it official yet. They couldn't do that till morning. That would be the third trial. So in the time in between, one of the scenes that hits me in the heart every time I read through it is you have these soldiers who apparently with some time to waste, spend their time mocking Jesus, spitting on Jesus, and hitting him. Hitting him and saying, if you're the Christ, why don't you prophesy? Who hit you? Who hit you? Jesus, I wish he would have answered their questions for myself. Just to show them that Jesus knew exactly who they were and everything about them. But he didn't. He endured that beating through the night. And then the third trial came very quickly when morning came. They made it official. They said, let's get together and let's, let's convict him of blasphemy. And they did. And they sent him on to Pilate. When they sent him to Pilate, that begins the three Roman trials. And, the, and to Pilate, they don't come in and say, Here, this guy committed blasphemy. Please kill him. The Romans don't care about blasphemy. So they had to change the charges. They said, this guy's committing treason against Caesar. Because he says he's a king. Now, we know there's only one King Caesar. He's causing riots everywhere he goes. He's stirring up the people. We need to have him killed. Pilate says, I don't see any guilt in this guy. But they keep going. And, and when he hears this from Galilee, he sends him to Herod, who was in town in Jerusalem, who was over the jurisdiction of Galilee. Uh, and so Pilate's hoping to get rid of him. He sends him for the second Roman trial over to Herod. Herod was excited. He'd heard stories about Jesus. He hoped he might do something special. He could see it. Jesus is not doing miracles today. Jesus knows this is a bigger day for things that, whether he wants to endure them or not, is what's most needed for mankind. And so Jesus does not do miracles for Herod. Herod finally sends him back after his own soldiers make fun of Jesus for a while and put a robe on him, which I wonder if that was in some way to try to mock Jesus, that he says he's a king, 
here's your robe, and sends him back to Pilate. In some way, that gesture, the Bible says, helped Pilate and Herod become friends that day. They had not been friends before that. And so he goes back for the third Roman trial, the sixth and final trial before Pilate. And they're here with, before Pilate, and, and Pilate's still trying to let him go. In fact, God had, 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 there had been a dream with Pilate's wife, and Pilate's wife sends word to Pilate, says, don't have anything to do with that man. She even knew in some way from her dream that this man was special. And so Pilate's trying to let him go, but the people keep going. And Pilate finally says, look, we release somebody at the feast every year. It's a special act of mercy. Do you want me to release Jesus or do you want me to release Barabbas? And the, the rulers get the people all riled up and they say, you killed Jesus, release Barabbas. Pilate may be in one last chance to try to get Jesus from not being killed. He had him scourged. Again, one of those painful things that the Bible doesn't tell us all the details about. Maybe we don't want it to. But the, the leather cords of a scourging whip that often had metal balls or pieces of bone on the ends of it that would tear down on the back and then tear back as that whip was pulled back again. And Jesus is scourged, something that often left people right at the doorstep of death. And then Pilate brings him out. After this time, they've already they've mocked him again. They put a crown of thorns on him. He brings him out and says, look it, behold the man. And the people still aren't done. They say, crucify him. Pilate tries to wash his hands and say, fine, you do what you want. Do what you want. By the way, if you remember what got Pilate to finally do it, they said, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. If you were not a friend of Caesar in the Roman Empire, that was treason. Pilate didn't want that charge to get started. So he said, okay, you can kill him. And so they take him out. And, and John tells us that he went out carrying his own cross. The other gospels tell us they asked Simon of Cyrene to carry it. We sometimes put two and two together through history. And people have wondered if maybe Jesus fell under the load of the cross. The Bible doesn't say that. But John does say he carried it, and the other gospel accounts say that Simon was asked to carry it. So maybe, maybe Jesus could only carry it so far after the scourging and the beatings and the sleeplessness and all he'd already been through. And maybe he fell under it and they had to ask someone else to take it out. And then it, they go out to the place, and that's that simple account that we read at the very beginning, where they crucified him. There's so much there. In that simple little phrase that we're not told. You've probably heard people, people who know much more than me about the medical side of crucifixion, talk about just why it was so painful. And how oftentimes you would have to pull yourself up, pushing down on your feet, and pulling yourself up just to breathe. And that that's why they were going to break the legs of the people on the cross to let them go ahead and die quicker. Because they put, couldn't push themselves up to breathe. And I don't know that I know a lot about that. The Bible just says they crucified him. We know it was terrible. We know they did it in different ways. But we know from Christ, he at least was, had nails through his hands, as he would later say uh, to Thomas, as Thomas would say, unless I see that nail print in his hands and the spear in his side, the place where the spear went in, I'm not going to believe. Jesus would come up to him and say, look, here they are. And we know they must have put nails in his feet too because in Luke 24, after Jesus rose again, he says to the disciples, look, uh, see my hands and my feet. Jesus had the nails in his hands and his feet. Sometimes they did it differently. Sometimes they tied people to the cross. Uh, Jesus had the nails through him. And even that, again, just makes us realize the depth of the pain he went through for us. Jesus then would hang on the cross. You probably heard sermons about the seven statements from the cross. As he was saying those seven statements, darkness falls over the land from noon until 3 p.m. as if God believed that the sun should not shine on this terrible occasion. And the seven sayings, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He said to the thief next to him, Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. He said to his mom, who was right there, and John, the only apostle that was there with him near the cross, said, Woman, behold your son, behold your mother, asking John to take care of her. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A quote from the Psalms that, that perhaps showed the depth of his feeling. He said, I'm thirsty. He said, It is finished. Finally, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
and he died. And as he died, he died quicker than the other ones. In fact, Pilate was surprised at how quick he had died. I guess the scourging and everything else had taken it out of Jesus quicker, perhaps. But as he died, you remember that the veil of the temple was torn. It was torn, Mark tells us, from top to bottom, as if God himself was tearing it to show that the, the veil between us and God had been taken away. Joseph of Arimathea comes and asks for the body of Jesus, and he takes it. Joseph was part of the Jewish council, and yet here he is stepping forward to stand with Jesus in his lowest hour. And then Nicodemus, another part of the Jewish leadership, stands forward with Jesus and takes spices to wrap him and put him in a tomb nearby. All of that, as we look back from the cross, what does that tell you? Why do we rehearse the story? First of all, I hope we, I hope we often rehearse the story. I think not only do we need to hear it, I think people who listen to us preach, those of us that are preachers need to hear it, need to be reminded simply of what the Bible tells us about what God did and what Christ did for us. But again, just like that overlook I mentioned earlier, it gives me an appreciation, an appreciation for the way God brought it all together, for all that Jesus went through, for how committed he was to dying for us. At any minute, he could have said, let's not do this. Let's just call the angels. Let's just end it all. It's their fault anyway. That's probably what I would have said. It's their fault anyway. Uh, these people are spitting on me. They're beating me. They're laughing at me. And I'm trying to do this for them. Let's just end it. And yet he goes through it all for us. I told you I wanted to spend the most time looking backwards because that path to the cross, I hope, challenges us. I want to send a spend a couple minutes looking upwards as we stand here right by the cross. As we look up at God, how do we see God we stand here next to the cross of Christ. Well, the thing that stands out more than anything is God's love, isn't it? To go through all that, to go through this plan, to, for Jesus to come here at all. And that's what often stands out. Jesus said in John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. As Romans 5, verse 8 would say, God demonstrates his own love toward us. The cross was in, in not only to save us from our sins, but also to show us the love of God. Demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I like the way 1 John 3.16 puts it. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. How do you know love? You see it. You see it in the cross. As you see Jesus hanging there, as you see Jesus going through all this, you want to know what love looks like. 1 John 3.16 says we know it because we've seen it in him laying down his life for us. We look up from standing here at the cross and we see a God who loves us so much. You probably have times in your life where you wonder why things happen. Maybe you wonder why they happen to you. Maybe you wonder if God has cared or notices. As we stand here at the cross, we're reminded the love of God is never in question. I may not know why things happen. I may not know how it all comes together. I may not get to have the Joseph moment here in life where I see it all come together. I may end up like Job and not get to see it till life is over and then see why things happen the way they do. But as I stand here at the cross and look up, I can't forget. God loves me. Whatever's happening and why, the problem is not that God does not love me. And as I look up from here at the cross, I also see that God is a God of justice. Why did Jesus do this at all? Why, why didn't he, as, as people outside the Christian faith often say today, why didn't God just forgive? He's God, why can't he just forgive? And I think we see something about the justice of God there. We forget sometimes to just let sin go is not good. If a judge just got up and, and let... Someone, just let them go. Out of, out of my mercy today, I know that this person killed several people and, 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 and raped and hurt others, but I'm just going to let them go. You know what? There would be an outcry, and there should be. Because we have that sense of justice. It's not good to just let evil go. And so God had to somehow save us, but not let evil go, and we couldn't pay for it ourselves. And his amazing wisdom was the cross where he could pay for it in full justice to pay the price for sins, but also in full love to let us go. That sense of justice that we see in God. Uh, by the way, C.S. Lewis, it's always been interesting to me, C.S. Lewis said that we have that sense of justice, and he said, I think that has to be God. He said, because why in the world would we look around at our world and think that, that justice is something that should happen? 
Justice doesn't happen in our world, doesn't happen in nature, doesn't happen the way people treat each other. Why in the world do we have this sense of justice inside of us? He said, I think that's God that gave us that. I think he's probably right about that. I look up from the cross and I see the amazing love, the amazing justice of God. What about looking outward from the cross? As we stand here next to Christ and we see the crowd that's mocking and spitting, making fun of him, the Jewish leaders think this is their greatest moment to laugh at Jesus, who thought, who all the crowd loved, but now he can't do anything as he's stuck on the cross. And yet Jesus says what in Luke 23? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That amazes us. While he's being crucified, not later, not later when they come, come back crawling for repentance. Don't, don't wait for that. While he's being crucified, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As we look outward, we see all this evil, and yet Jesus still loves. By the way, the rest of the New Testament would say that's how we should look outward from the cross, too. That as we look at people, 1 Peter 2.21 says, Jesus, in the way he suffered, left us an example. And what that example is, he didn't commit any sin, verse 22 says. No deceit was found in his mouth. Verse 23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. He didn't even talk back to him. He didn't even say, you don't know what you're doing. You have no idea who you put on the cross. None of that. None of that. He doesn't even talk back to them. He says, while suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And that becomes our example. You might notice, revenge sort of floats in the air in our culture. People write movies and stories and songs about getting people back, showing them you're better. Competition is, is what people seem to thrive on so often. People want to win and be better than others. But if we're Christians... If we're standing at the cross and looking outward, that's not the way we see the world. We don't see the world with a desire for revenge or a desire to win or a desire to show someone how great we are. We look the way Jesus did. He's our example. We look out with a sense of forgiveness, a sense of love. We're not uttering threats. We entrust it to God, as that verse says. God will take care of that. He's a God of justice. He's a God of love. He knows what needs to happen and what doesn't. He knows who needs to be shown his judgment and who doesn't. God will take care of all that. That's not my job. I don't look out with revenge. I look out from the cross with a sense of love like Christ did. As we look out from the cross, we're also reminded of Philippians 2, what Jesus is doing here. What he's doing is putting others ahead of himself. Not my will, but yours be done, he had prayed. We do the same thing. We have this attitude, Philippians 2 says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. He came here, and as verse 8 will go on to say, he, he was obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. When he came to this cross, he was obeying, he was putting others ahead of himself. That's hard. That's not what our culture does. Our culture says, you take care of yourself. You put yourself first. You glorify yourself. No one else is going to do it. You've got to lift yourself up. I remember going to... a a lectureship at Fried Hardman uh, years ago was when I was first going to transfer there and, and decide to preach. I didn't know any of the preachers at that time and still a lot that I haven't got to meet yet. But one of the preachers speaking at that lectureship, first one I'd ever been to, he said, some people can't see the cross because even the preacher won't get himself out of the way. That always stuck with me. That even in ministry, maybe, sometimes we're tempted to glorify ourselves. Sometimes we're tempted to lift ourselves up. But if I'm standing here at the cross and I'm looking outward the way Jesus did, uh, I'm trying to get myself out of the way, put others ahead of myself. It's not the way the world does it. It's the way Christ did it. 1 John 3, 16, again, at the end of that verse, he says, since Jesus had done that, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We see him laying down his life for the brethren. And so just like him, we need to lay down our lives for the brethren. We need to be people like they were in the book of Acts, Christians who are willing to do anything for each other. We can do anything to help each other out, to pour ourselves out for the kingdom of God. We look outward from the cross and hopefully we see people differently than we often do. How about looking forward? We looked backwards for a long time, a big part of this lesson. We looked backwards, we saw the foreshadows of the cross in the Old Testament. 
Uh, we saw the path to the cross. What about looking forward from here in the grand story of Scripture as we stand at the cross? Going forward from here, everything's different. Everything's different. In fact, it's a new covenant. All the covenants of the Old Testament from Noah and Abraham and then that covenant of Moses that had been God's covenant with people for so long, it ended right here at this cross. It ended as Jesus had said in Matthew 26, 28, Mark says the same thing. For this is my blood of the covenant. That's what he called his blood. My blood of the covenant. In other words, that blood was going to begin a new covenant with God's people. Hebrews 9 would compare it to a will. As the Hebrew writer would say, no will takes effect while someone's alive. It's when they die is when it begins. And so the covenant of Christ from here forward from the cross, that's now the covenant which we relate to God. There's a lot of confusion about that still in our religious world. I think you know that. And, and still we must be ready to explain to people kindly, lovingly, what Hebrews 9 and Matthew 26 say. That at the cross, we're under the covenant of Christ now. And we learn from the Old Testament. We don't throw it away. We don't stop studying it. We still grow from it. But we don't go to the Old Covenant to say, how do we worship? How are we saved? How do we, how do we live? It is our example. It is not our law. It's not our covenant. Our covenant is the covenant of Christ. And we're reminded going forward. And in fact, Jude 3, I think I have up here, I do calls it the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Going forward from here on out to the end of time, the covenant of Christ is how God will relate to mankind. Everything changes from here on out. What else changes is this message of the cross. It's going to go everywhere. I mean, here we are on May 1st, 2019, the other side of the world, and the message of the cross is still going out. It went out from this place, if we're standing on the overlook of the, the story of Scripture, it went out from here, from Jerusalem, and to Judea and Samaria, and all the ends of the earth, as Acts 1-8 will describe it. It goes everywhere. Every city has changed. In fact, in just a few decades, people are saying, these people who have turned the world upside down, they've come here too, they say in Thessalonica. This message of the cross would change everything. And that message was the Christian message, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I believe the Bible teaches everything in the Bible is important. Everything's important. But there are some things of first importance. And Paul says here, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. How does he start? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then he was buried, he was raised again. Of first importance, that message, that Christian message is Christ died for us. That message of the cross is what would change people. It's what would change the world. I love what Paul said earlier in 1 Corinthians 2 2. He says, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's our message. Everything hangs from that. Everything's important. Everything about the church and about worship, everything we do in the Christian life is important. And it hangs from that. But it starts with the cross. It started right here. And so going forward, the message of the cross is what will change hearts and lives and change even the whole world. I want to send for our last couple minutes to look inward. We've looked backwards. We've looked upwards at God. We've looked outwards at people. We've looked forwards at the way the cross message would change the world. Now, let's look inward for just a minute. Because standing here by the cross is the best place to look inward. It gives us some humility, or it should. Sometimes we're tempted to think that we've got it, we're doing pretty good. Maybe you can find other people in your life that you think, well, I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm doing better than they are. I'm living better than they are. I'm not making mis the mistakes they are. But then when you look at the cross, Jesus dying on the cross for my sins, it slaps me in the face. It reminds me that I'm sinful like everyone else. And it is my sins that were evil like everyone else. It's my sins that put Jesus here on the cross. There's a humility that's gained from lingering here around the cross. There's also a sense of sacrifice. Because I see Jesus here pouring himself out for the plan of God. And then Jesus had said in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus never says following him would be easy. He never says, just give me a little bit. Just give me a little bit of your life. Jesus never said that to anybody. What he says is, you take your cross. 
And here's Jesus pouring himself out. And it makes me ask myself, am I pouring myself out for the cross? For God? For Jesus Christ? Or am I just sort of here? Am I just sort of in? Am I just giving God little pieces and then pursuing my own stuff the rest of the time? Or am I taking up my cross? Paul would say it this way. I have been crucified with Christ. I died on that cross. Or I should have. When I was buried with him in baptism, united with his death in baptism, as Romans 6, 3 and 4 describes it, uh, I was crucified with Christ. So it's not me living anymore. It's Christ living in me. Humility, sacrifice, that goes on, I think, in Galatians 6, 14, when Paul says, May it never be the most except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Is that a reality in my life? Or am I still worldly? Am I still chasing worldly stuff? Am I sort of halfway in with God? Or, or am I taking up my cross and being crucified with Him? It also makes me ask myself, do I love God like I should? I imagine the answer to that will probably always be no. But I want to love Him more as I stand here by the cross and I look inward. Jesus said in John 14, 31, I love this verse. He says, so that the world may know that I love the Father. I do exactly as the Father commanded me. If I love him, I'm going to do exactly as he commanded me. And that's where that full life of obedience comes in. I don't just want to do a little bit of what he commanded me. When you love God, you want to try to do everything he's commanded you. One thing I've always loved about churches of Christ is the goal of trying to do everything the way God has asked us to do it and trying to do everything as best we can, however imperfectly, but trying to do it God's way. And we do that not because we're trying to save ourselves. We do that not because we think we're better than anybody else, but we do it because we love God. That's the motive. I see Jesus on the cross and I love God, so I want to give him everything. I want to give him everything. I want to do exactly as the Father commanded me, out of the right motives. The cross of Jesus Christ. We look backwards the way God brought the whole plan together. We look upwards at a God who loves us and a God of justice. We look outwards at a sinful world and we're reminded that we need to have an attitude of love and forgiveness toward them. We look forwards and we see how everything was changed from the cross, the covenant of Christ, the message of the cross that would change the world forever. We look inwards at ourselves, looking for more humility, more sacrifice, more love of God. It is no accident that God wanted his people to start every week by coming together and gathering around a table and remembering the cross. I love the words of the song. It's simple. It's one that we've sung a million times, at least, uh, at least I have. I'm sure you have here as well. It says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. I love that, don't you? And the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. That's where I could first see the world clearly, see myself clearly. And now I'm happy all the day. The verses are just as good. He says, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? Was it for crimes that I had done, he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. In the last verse, it talks about life change. He says, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. The cross changes everything. It should change us. Lord, I give myself away. May we never lose the wonder of the cross. May we never tire of its message. And may we live in such a way that the world may see its glory living in us. Let's pray as we close. God, we are so thankful for all that you do in our lives. And we're so thankful for Jesus coming to this earth and going to the cross for us. God, every time we, re we revisit it, it reminds us of your greatness and uh, our humility um, and our love for you is deepened. God, we pray that we'll love you more. We pray that we'll sacrifice for you more. We pray that our lives will reflect you more. 
We're so thankful for the cross. We pray you'll help us to live it out. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.